Okay, yeah. Hi, everyone. So today we'll be talking about user, user needs and user interviews. And I guess just as a disclaimer, I guess I, 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 could, I would consider myself more of a programmer than a hardware engineer, but I guess my training has sort of also been from the hardware engineering side and making physical products. And whenever you make a physical device, once you build it, you can't really make changes to it very easily. And so I guess that's part of why nailing down exactly what you need at the beginning is very important. And I guess that will also sort of inform this class. But I hope that this will be helpful for you both at WebLab and beyond. And so yeah, let's dive in. So we'll be talking about user needs and user interviews. I hope that this will be a very helpful lecture for you and that you can get some clear takeaways. So if there's one thing that you can learn from this lecture or from the next 30 minutes, I hope that it will be this. There's one question that I want all of you to be asking over and over and over again whenever you're thinking of anything, both in terms of design, but also outside of design. And that question is, what do you see that makes you say that? So whenever you make any sort of observation, ask yourself, why have you made that observation? What is it? What do you see that makes you say, you know, X? And this is based on a concept first introduced in teaching art called visual thinking strategies or VTS. What do I see that makes me say that? And what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at an example. So in web lab, we like to talk about all sorts of th different things. You've all heard about Catholic a lot, worked with it a lot. We also really encourage you to use Piazza. We talk about memes sometimes. MD and web docs. And one of those things that we also talk about a lot is the web lab restaurant. So let's take a look at this restaurant. And I also want this to be sort of an interactive class. So this is an oil painting by an American artist by the name of Edward Hopper. And some of you could call this sort of iconic. If you're curious, you can find this in the Art Institute of Chicago. But what I want to ask you today is just for one, of two of you, one or two of you to shout out, what do you think is going on in this picture? There's no right or wrong answer, but yeah, what can you observe? What do you think is going on in this picture? I just want one or two people to shout out, shout something out. Sorry, could you repeat it? I can't hear you well enough. Okay, you see a diner late at night. Okay, what, what do you see that makes you say that this is late at night? It's a dark, sorry, could you? It's dark out? Okay. It's dark out? Anything else you want to point out? It's very dark? Oh, the, the door is, the door is, oh, the store is closed. Across the street, the store is closed. That's great. Thanks. That's a really, really great observation. Do we want to have one more person give it a go? Thanks for sharing that. Go ahead. Okay, you said the people are wearing more formal clothing. Repeat the last part. They're probably outside, like celebrating something. Is that sort of what you're saying? Okay. And what do you see that makes you say that it's formal clothing, let's say? It can be simple questions like that. Sorry, could you just. La. Oh, okay, got it. Thanks. So this guy's wearing. Uh, a suit and this lady is wearing a dress. Okay, that's great. I was also prepared in case nobody said anything. So I also asked some random people what they thought about this. And one guy told me, and I'm quoting approximately here, he said that it's like a noir movie with cats and tuxedos and the composition is like that of a nostalgic era. There's a couple and an old timey guy and a pharmacist prepping something. He actually called this guy a, a pharmacist. And I didn't say anything about a restaurant to him. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything about a restaurant to you guys either because that maybe sort of buys your interpretation. But what I want to demonstrate is you can always ask yourself, you know, what do you see that makes you say that there's an old timey guy? What is it about that guy that speaks old timey to you? And who are you describing as a pharmacist? And what about that person makes you say that he or she is a pharmacist? And also just interestingly, I told ChatGPT to make a story about this diner in the style of Ernest Hemingway. And ChatGPT actually described this woman or a lady as a server or a waitress, actually. So that's, I guess, another interesting interpretation. But the, the, goal, the goal of this really is to think about any sort of website that you see and think about why you have some sort of an impression about it, right? So just then, William talked about the feel of a website, right? And a feel is a very, sort of like a very qualitative thing. It's hard to describe. It's hard to describe, I feel. But you really want to just ask yourself, 
some of those same questions and try to understand what is it that makes certain websites work and try to incorporate that into your website. So let's take a look at some real websites that exist and ask ourselves the same questions. So on the left here, this is a screenshot of the website of Wired Magazine, the same day of the, 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 same day of the week a year ago from the third Thursday of 2022. And on the right, we have a screenshot of Wired Magazine from the same URL. It's actually not from today, it's from two days ago, just slight disclosure, but I'm pretty sure it looks the same today. So what do we see that, I guess, how are these two websites different? Can we have just one person shout up? Go ahead, sir. There's, there's less stories? Okay. Can you talk, say something about how you feel about these two websites? How do they feel different to you? The new one is more modern? Okay, that's, that's a great observation there. And what do you see that makes you say the new website is more modern? Okay, less elements, no background. That's great, thanks. So what I would have said was that I feel that the old website is a little bit more fun, right? And, but at the same time, it does feel quite professional. And why do I say that? Maybe it's the color, maybe it's the way that they're incorporating these boxes. To be honest with you, I can't tell you for sure, but I really just want you guys to start thinking about those questions and just ask yourself anytime, what do you see that makes you say something? So yeah, there are gonna be three goals of this lecture. Number one, we definitely wanna think more deeply about maybe a superficial opinion or a first impression. Is there something about a particular feature beyond the feature itself? that leads a website to be successful at what it is trying to do. And then number two, I want you to think about what a customer wants or what a user wants and compare those with customer needs. And not just always to think about the features. So don't just think about the features. And I feel like that's a challenge because I, that's a challenge that I constantly face because we only have like four weeks, right? Less than that now. And so we have to prioritize what we, what we can implement accordingly. I'm just calling it a customer instead of a user, just because if you have a website and you think of it as a product that you want people to use, then you want to have customers for that product. And then finally, I want you to, after this lecture, go out, get out of the classroom, talk to some real people. Six is a good number, a good start. And we'll talk about some questions that you can ask them to help inform your design choices and your development. And yeah, it's the same thing. I just added another bullet point here. It doesn't look as nice. So that's why I showed the first slide there. So yeah, let's, let's brainstorm. So let's say that you're a student in web lab and that's what we're all here for, right? And you're thinking of a website that you might wanna make for IEP, right? That was sort of milestone zero, milestone one. And I know all of you have, so, so I know all of you have done this already. And you might think, what's well, something that I enjoy? Why don't I take it and I make it better? So you come up with something called 2048. And that's the game where you have those boxes. Those boxes have numbers on them and you wanna combine the boxes with matching numbers so that you get the highest number that you can, just like you see in this image here. And you might be thinking, okay, 2048 is a really fun game. I love to play in the time I have in between classes. Why don't I replicate it and add some sort of useful or interesting or distinctive or just cooperative feature that makes it unique and this will really take off, right? And so what I'd say is, of course, ask yourself, what do I see that makes me say that? What do I see that makes me say that 2048 is a really fun game? Is it that each round can be quite short, is quite short, and that you can easily pause and pick back up at any moment? Is it that the premise is simple to understand? Is it that there's some math involved, even if it's minimal, so that whoever is playing this feels a sense of self-confidence and intelligence? And you might laugh at that, but I feel that those things are important to, to, to think about. How does a website make someone feel? Does it make them feel smarter? Does it make them feel cool? And is that why they use your website? So whatever the reason is, that's probably something that you want to find out and replicate in what you built for web lab. We can't always understand why something becomes viral or how to make something viral, but you can go through each feature that you have and reason through what you, whether you really need to or should have it and what makes that work. And that brings us to our user requirements. But actually first, let's review what you need to do for web lab. So, what we tell you is that we require you to include certain functionalities with your website. We require a login system. We require dynamic content. That is your website must update itself depending on how a user interacts with it. And we also require a database and that will probably be necessary for the login feature and also for serving unique content to your visitors. But that leaves so much more open to different things that you can do and try out. And like I said, there's only a finite amount of time that we have. So we need to decide what's most important for us to implement first. 
So yeah, user needs. Let's think about things in terms of user needs. And I'll borrow a little bit, some terminology from the field of systems engineering, but I also won't follow all of the good systems engineering practices entirely because we're already skipping some steps, such as identifying what the real problems are. So what we've done for WebLab is, right now we do have a main website idea that we know that we wanna work on, right? And we're all students. So I assume that we know the problems that students face. So we can first start by writing down the problem that we're trying to solve with the website that we wanna build. And just the problem right now. And later on, we'll consider things like who has that problem that will come in for user interviews because you want to interview people who have that problem and how you'll solve that problem. And I'll show you examples of what I mean. I should point out that I have been heavily inspired by the milestone pitches that I've heard in the following examples. So maybe you feel that arcade games are hard to access and that they don't have inherent built in features for two players who simultaneously interact and play with each other. Maybe you feel that it's hard for friends to make music together in real time when they are in two different physical places. Maybe you feel, and this might be oddly specific here, maybe you feel that dating simulator games have a really large following, a really large audience, but they're just not as popular among MIT Core 6 students as they should be. Maybe you feel that dorm spam is just too ubiquitous and that essential information that they contain is not abstracted away well enough. This is not a concern in web lab, but if you're in another class, you might also be told to think about as part of your job. And we can try to do a little bit of this later in the user interviews. Think about whether or not the problem you want to solve is a real problem instead of a problem that only you or a, a few people face. So one way to identify that is of course, by just observing people, right? Like a day in the life of research where you follow someone to observe what problems come up. And we won't be talking about that here. We won't be talking about that here because you're all free to pursue your own ideas for what you want to make in your website. So let's talk about Kappa, our favorite example for everything. And let's use this as an exercise to talk about our problem. So here, our problem is that we feel that web lab students don't have a Facebook-like type chat group thingy with an integrated agar.io game. And that will come in to play in later lectures. And so that's what we're trying to solve in these workshop exercises that you've been following along with. So we have some ideas and we have a problem that we want to solve. And I want to talk about our needs and wants or what we think our users needs and wants are. So we already have an idea right now, probably some idea of what we want our website to accomplish. We can also talk to our friends or other people who we could see using the website. And that's important. You want to try to talk to people who your website is intended for and see what they think would be useful to fix the, their problem or the problem that you've identified that they also face. One way to identify these needs and wants then is therefore through interviews, and so surprise, surprise, and of course, we'll talk more about that later. You can also brainstorm with your team members. Of course, you should absolutely do that. And then some of you may be thinking, why don't we go look at some pre-existing websites? So in that 2048 example, why don't we go look at the original 2048 and think about how it works, what sort of works, and backtrack from there to what someone needs. And that could work. I just want to point out that you should be careful to always ask deeper questions about whether something is like whether it fulfills a need or there's much more of a nice to have thing. And also ask yourself, what do you see that makes you say that? So for Catbook, just from our brainstorming, we have now in addition to our problem, we have a list of the things that we need and that we want our website to have. So we say that our website needs to allow shouting among our web students, needs to allow spontaneous slide conversations, allow private conversations between web students, and the website needs to look modern. So that's a good point about how Wired Magazine looks modern or has a modern website today. And also we want our website to allow playing a game. And I put agar.o in brackets there because I feel like that, and this can go on and off, but I feel like that it's important to, to not really bias ourselves as to how to implement something. So unless you really need, or in this case, really want agar.io, you should not explicitly say that you want it. Rather, you should probably say something that what you really want is a game that is not necessarily agar.io. And maybe agar.io is just the game that best fits your requirements for what you want out of your game. So you want to find your general need and not necessarily one thing that satisfies your general need because that specific thing may not be the best way to satisfy your need. I hope that sort of makes sense and I'll get back to that later. So when you make your needs and wants basically, don't list features or try not to list features. Rather try to list something that the feature solves. I hope that's clear to people. And after we have our needs and wants because of course we don't have uh, an infinite amount of time, we want to rank the importance of our needs and wants. And so as the web lab, as the web lab staff will tell you, 
First, you want to nail down your most important essential feature or features. So there is also there's also a concept in systems engineering called critical to quality, and you definitely want to get those done. And then you can do whatever else you have planned to do in the order that you have in the order of the importance that you have identified. And we can also ask in our user interviews later on what needs or features do people feel are most important to them, and that can also help us decide what to prioritize. There's a concept in multiple fields and web development has been described as one of them called the Pareto principle and what this general rule of thumb says is that 80% of the effect or the consequences or the satisfaction of your most important needs and wants comes from 20% of the causes or the time and effort that you put in. And so, of course, you want to maximize what you get out for the amount of time that you spend on your web lab website. So let's go ahead and quickly assign some importance rankings. So you decide that chatting is like the most essential feature of your website. That's a five right there. You can use like a scale of one to 10 or whatever scale you want. You decide that your website also absolutely needs to look modern. And then the game, spontaneous site conversations and private conversations are sort of deprioritized and less important. And so, and now we'll translate our needs and wants into user requirements. And also it's important to point out here that that's user requirements and not design requirements because we're not yet considering how we want to implement something. We're really not thinking about features, but about what we need to get done. So what to do and not how to do something. And these are just some general guidelines that you can find. So requirements should be specific. There should be a single main idea contained in each requirement. Requirements should be unique and obviously not repetitive. Although you could have, for example, like a requirement and then a sub requirement that fulfills that main requirement, that's totally okay. Requirements should be feasible. They shouldn't be something you cannot accomplish with modern technologies today. If you want to do something that you don't really know how to implement, try talking to web lab staff, or if that's really not a possibility, then try doing something else. Requirements should be traceable. Oh, sorry, requirements should be flexible. That means that we should not say how a requirement is going to be implemented only that it needs to be satisfied and requirements should be traceable. That means that we should be able to trace each requirement to the need that it fulfills. That's important because we want to ask why we need every single feature that we implement. We want to ask why we need every single requirement. And yeah. And then finally, or I, I guess this is not totally relevant to WebLab, but requirements should also be quantitative and testable. That's something you might hear in other classes. It's important to be able to evaluate if you meet or fail those requirements. And you probably would need precise numbers for that. And then finally, we also want to be able to track any changes that we make to our requirements. So, you know, whenever we add or delete or modify our requirements, similar to how we use Git when we're programming, we should give version numbers to each iteration of our requirements document. So let's take a look at an example requirement. An example requirement might be something like our website needs to allow multiple users in the game lobby. Or sorry, no, that's not. So an example requirement might be our website needs to allow multiple users in the same game instance. And requirements engineering is literally a whole field. And this will only be a brief overview that doesn't actually follow all of the exact principles. But so for example, I, I use the phrase the web page needs, the, web, the website needs. Well, in requirements engineering, people commonly use phrases like should, like shall, will, and must if something's required, and may if something is optional. The goal is to have a really have, give us give ourselves a clear framework at the beginning of what we want to implement and why, and to be sure as we're implementing things that we are actually that we are actually covering every single thing that we say that we want to implement. And the reason that website needs to have a game lobby is not so good as a requirement is because it's more of a how you will implement question and not a what fundamental requirement do I need most. So here you're making a determination that a game lobby is the best way to meet your requirement for having multiple people in the same game instance. But a game lobby may or may not be the best way to do that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. If you wanna get fancy, you can also include a reasoning for why you include each of your requirements. And I guess maybe you sort of should do that, but it might be extra work. So only do it if you find it helpful for you, I guess. And yeah, I really wanna emphasize that the goal is to stop thinking about things in terms of features, in terms of the cool gimmicks or extras that would make your website really stand out. But to think about things in terms of the tangible things that you're trying to accomplish, the tangible things that each feature is trying to accomplish, and you want to evaluate for each of those things whether you really need it or not. Also, there, I guess the other problem with listing features is that let's say that I want to make like a let's say that I have a problem where I want to be able to 
make music with my friends in real time. If I list in my needs and requirements that it needs to have a shared playlist, then I'm sort of making an assumption there that a shared playlist is the best way to make music with my friends for like social outings. But maybe that isn't the best way to do things. So let's say that I want to build a chat feature, right? And so I would ask myself, what is the goal here, right? I want to think beyond the feature. Is it for players to communicate in real time? Is it for players to communicate with, with each other with a time delay? Is it for players to express themselves? And I guess that you could say that a chat feature is sort of an essential feature of most games. But if your goal is for players to express themselves, right? Maybe you don't need a chat feature. Maybe there's a creative way that can go about it, sort of like how Fortnite uses those dance moves for players to express themselves, right? Or like, yeah, stuff like that, like skins. So you don't necessarily need a chat feature, maybe. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I need a bookmark feature. Do you really need a bookmark feature? So ask yourself again, what is the goal here? Why do you want a bookmark feature? Is it for users to store specific information? And if it is for users to store specific information, what information specifically do we want people to be able to store? What information would help people the most? So then again, ask yourself, you know, is the general bookmark feature really the best way to achieve this? Or will there be extra unnecessary information that you're storing with that bookmark feature that becomes inconvenient? So maybe if you press bookmark on something, maybe you don't want to store the entire post or whatever. Maybe you want to store certain dates or locations in that post. And maybe you have a different goal. That's to pick up from reading a feed from where you left off. And so what this is supposed to illustrate is that when you list out your requirements, you're supposed to find which, which features are best for that requirement and to avoid making assumptions about which features you need. And so now let's talk about how you will fulfill all those requirements that you've written. So here for the first time, we'll actually talk about the features that we're going to be using. You don't need to know how to implement your features yet, only what features you want to implement. And we'll think about things in terms of having a system and then having subsystems within that system. We'll make a, we'll make a diagram for everything, sort of like a flow chart. And you can think back to when we were talking about React components and making a React component tree, except instead of information about states and props, we'll add in different information on our chart. So we'll add in functions that our overall system needs to perform. And again, that should be the what. And each of these functions should correlate with the requirements that you have. And you can divide things into requirements and sub-requirements they sort of mentioned. You can divide things into systems and subsystems. You want to lay out your website and match each subsystem with the requirement that it fulfills. And then, of course, you want to make sure, go through your design and make sure that you do indeed fulfill each of your requirements. Some, and I guess there are also, um, there are also, there's also the concept of verification and validation, where in terms of verification, you want to make sure that your design actually fulfills all of your requirements. So you're sort of asking yourself, are we going to build something right? And then validation is the concept where you take your design and you ask yourself if it actually fulfills someone's needs for their problem. And so it's sort of like, did we build the right thing? And if you want to get really fancy or in depth into this, there are all sorts of standards like the ISO 9001 standard that talks about quality management, including verification and validation. So there's also the ISO IEC IEEE 15288 standard that covers software engineering. And I'll basically just be skipping over anything where you're evaluating your work but verification and validation can be part of your process too. So this is a bit simplified, but it illustrates the point where you sort of just make a diagram with your system and your subsystems, and you label basically what functions you want each of your subsystems to have, how it interacts with your other subsystems, and any sort of user action that you can take from this. And this can probably help you when you're making your website to make sure that everything connects together appropriately. So yeah, to summarize first, so we've all basically already identified the problem that we wanna solve. From our problem, we can identify what we actually need or want in order to solve that problem. From those needs and wants, we can derive user requirements that can satisfy those needs and wants. And it's important to remember that for our requirements, we wanna talk about what we need to do and not how we're gonna do it. So instead of thinking about features, we want requirements that are specific, unique, feasible, flexible, and traceable. And then we can design our system and subsystem in a way that fulfills all the requirements. And then there's also a verification validation step after that that we're going to skip over. So we have a list of 
So from making your, your flow chart here, you have a list of, oh, that got cut off here, okay. But you have a list of what a user can do with your website, right? And a part of doing good design is making sure that people can use your website effectively. Actually, let's, let's backtrack a little bit. So if the message has not come across yet, I want you guys to always be asking questions and always ask why. And about the simplest question they can ask here is, why in the world would you even want to do a user interview? Is that sort of like a waste of time? Is that absolutely necessary for you guys? Maybe it's not a big, maybe it's not absolutely necessary guys, but here are some reasons why you might want to do interviews. So interviews can be helpful for you in verifying that problem exists. Again, ideally it's a problem that a lot of people face and not just a small group of people or not just yourself. You can do interviews to help you understand people's needs and expectations. So for example, in that 20, or let's not take 2048 as an example. Let's sort of talk about a news website. So like, for example, like do all news websites have some sort of a feature for sharing articles on social media? It certainly feels that way to me. And so if we sort of come to expect that, we sort of come to expect having the ability to share articles that we read on social media. Is that a feature that you need to implement if you were to do a news website? Well, let's say you were to do a website about like a, a fitness tracking website. Is there sort of an expectation now that you can share your fitness monthly goals or whatever on social media? So if users either need or expect something, that's probably something you should get covered. And that is what interviews will stop. Those are things that interviews will help you with. And the final thing I have here is interviews can help you test your minimum viable product, which is what you're going to be doing for Milestone 2. So after you deploy your website, you can talk to people, have people use your website and observe how they use it. If things work out well for them, if they get stuck on a certain step, if it only takes them too long, you probably want to go ahead and change it. So what do you need to know for user interviews? I've written out some tips here that I hope will be helpful for you. So I guess the first thing I've written here is try to formalize the process. What does that mean? Basically it means that you want to come prepared to any sort of interview. I guess first off, you probably want to do one-on-one -on -one interviews rather than group interviews, or if there's a really dominant person that might bias other people's opinions. And when you talk to people, you want to talk to people who are prospective users of your website. That's an important point. You want to talk to people who you feel share the problem that you have identified. And then you can ask them detailed questions about what their needs are. And then, yeah, so you also want to have a clear idea of what you want to test or learn. Do you want to learn about how people use email or what frustrations that they have with it so you can make their email, their email experience better? Do you want to learn about somebody's book reading habits so you can make a website for sharing books with people? But I also want to point out that if you come in wanting to see if a certain feature is helpful or not, you can totally ask people, you know, let's say that there's this feature on this website, do you think it's going to be helpful for you? You just have to be prepared that someone can totally tell you that, no, I think that's absolutely not going to be helpful. And I guess what you do with that feedback is sort of up to you, but I guess you sometimes just have to be open to making changes to your plan as a result of your interviews. You also want to, of course, take notes before, during, and after each interview. And this is a really important one that I feel that I mess up a lot more than I should because I, ne I neglect it sometimes and I basically always end up regretting it. Before the interview, you of course want to prep a list of questions that you want to ask people. You don't necessarily ask everybody the same questions because maybe something comes up in one interview that informs your perspective that you want to ask somebody else about. So you don't need to ask everybody the same questions. During the interview, you want to write down any key thoughts that you've heard or that you just think of and then after the interview, you want to go through any gaps in your notes because you should not have been writing all the time. You should have been paying attention and fill in any big ideas that you've learned. And when you add to your notes afterwards, you can also include any sorts of clear actions that you might take as a result of the interview. So maybe you decide to discard a certain feature because people didn't really feel that that feature would help their ultimate need. Or maybe you decide to include the feature anyways because you think it's a cool thing. And I guess that's okay. And we won't really say you can't do that. Try to use the words of the interviewee when you take notes so that you don't misinterpret them later on. And some interviews will be really helpful and give you tons of exciting ideas and things that you just want to get work, started working on immediately. And others won't be as helpful and that's okay. Just want to respect the interviewee's time. Try to cap your interview at something like 15 or 30 minutes. When you ask people, you can make that explicit, you know, hey, can I take up 30 minutes of your time to talk about, you know, how email processing is a, might be a pain for you and how we can improve your email experience. If you're having a really good conversation or if you think that someone is just like really interested and excited in the same problem that you are, of course you can ask to spend more time in them. Like I know we scheduled this for 30 minutes, but we've been having a really good conversation. 
you have some more time to talk with me. And I also want to point out that even though we might feel that we are able to connect with someone better and talk with them for 45 minutes and connect worse with someone else and talk with them only for like 15 minutes, that doesn't mean that one person's perspectives or opinions are more or less valid, right? Because we tend to connect with the people that we have more similarities with. We want to make sure that we can cover all sorts of diverse perspectives with our website. So don't necessarily just trust the judgment more of someone that you've interviewed for longer. Also, we want to minimize the time that we spend talking. Listening to someone is not waiting to talk. And you also don't want to be thinking about what's the next question that you're going to ask. That's why you have prepared beforehand with notes before your interview of questions that you do want to ask. You're not, you're not in the interview to pitch your idea to whoever you're interviewing. You're not there to convince them that your idea is super fantastic. You're not even there to convince them to try out your website, even though that would maybe would be a good outcome for you. And that would be a cool thing. You're there to get their thoughts on what sort of website would be useful to them in terms of a website that solves the problem that you're trying to address. And really listen to your interviewees. Don't, don't really be like prepping the next, the next question that you want to ask. And then here, I, you want to ask a lot of why questions. So you're there to understand someone's perspective, right? So sometimes they might first provide just a superficial reasoning. Maybe they haven't thought about something very deeply. Because if you ask me a question, I might just answer off of that what I feel. But that doesn't really provide a lot of insight into why I feel something is the case. So remember, our friend, what do you see that makes you say that? And so if I might say that, I might say that the New York Times has a, has a really good website, and you can look at them for inspiration, right? Does that really helpful? Does that really help you? Does it help you if you're interviewing someone and they say that you can look at the New York Times for inspiration? Maybe not really. Maybe you can get a little bit more help from that by asking them, what makes you say that the New York Times has a really good website? And what do you see on the website that's most helpful to you? And related to that, you also want to ask open-ended questions. It's always better to ask questions to start with something like why or what, rather than questions that start with is. So we'll see an example of that later. But for example, if someone, if, if you're curious about like, if you're curious about like sharing, so, if, you're, if you want to create an app about like sharing social events among friends, instead of asking, is it, are social events important to you? Ask people, what impact do social events have on your student experience? Or why are they important to you? And then this might be a, a weirdish one. You might be thinking, whoa, why is, why is this even here? Why is this on the page? And I guess the thing is, if you ask questions on something like a scale of 0 to 10, or a Likert scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree, you, if you have an odd number of choices, the interviewee can always default to the middle sort of neutral answer, you might say. And I, and I want to emphasize that. So you don't want to ask people anything with an odd number of choices, or they might default to the middle answer. Ask something with an, odd, with an even number of choices. So something like a scale of one to 10 instead of a scale of zero to 10. Ask people if they strongly disagree, disagree, agree, or strongly agree. Don't provide them the option to neither disagree nor agree. And then finally, oh, this is basically the, I'm sort of cramming here, but you want to thank the interviewee. And you want to really thank them because there's many times that they don't really need to talking with you. And of course, you're appreciative of that, right? And also, of course, the usual stuff that I can't fit in here about like dressing professionally, being on time, that sort of stuff. So what are some good questions that you might ask people? I guess maybe, I don't know if this would work for all of you, but maybe you could start with just a big general broad question about, you know, when you lie in bed, what keeps you awake? If you already know basically that you want to do an email scheduling app, let's say, you know, when you lie in bed at night, what about email keeps you awake? I don't know if people might be able to provide a good answer for that, but it's worth asking. You can ask people to think about the last time that they used a particular type of website and felt frustrated. Can you tell me more about that? You can ask people, what's wrong with this website that you use a lot? And by asking what's wrong, instead of asking, is it wrong? You can see that here. I'm trying to prompt more of an open-ended question, trying to prompt a more detailed answer. You can ask people, what do you think will help with this particular task? You can ask people what bottlenecks do you encounter when you face when you when you try to do this particular task. You can also ask people if you have a certain feature that you're really thinking about. How would this feature that you are suggesting be a help for you in accomplishing this task? And then maybe you can ask your interviewees to suggest features. 
If you read online, I think that you'll see a lot of websites that say not to do this, but I guess this could be helpful. So as long as you try to get at why someone suggests a feature, I think this could still be a good question to ask. So if you could, have, if you could make a website to do this particular task, what special features would it have? And then of course, the really good follow-up is, why are you suggesting this particular feature? And then you can also ask people to draw what a website that does a particular task looks like. This could, this could help you in terms of your design and also help you think about the usability of your website and how people interact with it. And of course, also what people expect to see from that website. So think back to what I said about news websites tending to have a social media share feature. So ask people to draw what a news website looks like. They might draw a social media share feature and that will sort of remind you that, you know, maybe I should have this because users are expecting this. And then there are also a bunch of just more bland questions that I don't, that I don't have here. You might want to ask people about their demographics. If you make an app about, I don't know, sharing kids toys, like you won't be talking to students for that, but like you might be asking like, you know, like how many kids have you had? Have you been thinking about having kids? How old are you? That sort of question. You can also ask about how often the problem presents itself. How often do you check your email for social events? But I guess just as another note, you can't necessarily take everything that your interviewee says word for word. So they might not know how something sh should work or even sometimes what they need. You always wanna be asking, what do you see that makes you say that? Or what is it that makes you say that? So someone might tell you about a problem they have. They might say, you know, I don't know what events my friends are attending right now. And that's a problem because I wanna know what events my, my friends are attending. But maybe the root problem here is that it's hard to share and keep track of the social events that are happening. And so this is what you want to address. You don't want to necessarily make something that broadcasts it. So what this does is this rephrases the problem and it tells you that there's a different way to approach it, right? So maybe your initial thought was, what if we made an app that broadcasts in real time social events that are happening to our friends? Well, the problem with that is that people can't plan ahead, right? What if we allow people to share events ahead of time and just generally share and keep track of events. And also someone might tell you that they need something that they maybe don't actually need. So someone might tell you that they need a shared music playlist, but maybe what they really need is a way to select music for social outings with their friends. And so maybe making a playlist is not the best method for fixing that problem that that person has. I hope that you understand what I'm trying to get at with these examples. So you don't want to assume how something will be implemented. You don't want to assume what feature you need. You want to think about what underlying problem actually exists and what needs to be done to fix that problem. So this is also why I wrote the requirements the way I did in the previous slide. Instead of saying something like, we need a green login button at the top right corner of the web page, something more like the web page needs to allow logging into accounts. If we want to have something like a sign in with Google feature or anything sort of more fancy or complicated like that, that maybe doesn't really, that isn't described by a single green login button at the top right corner of the website. So there might not be always be a single solution to what we want to do. And so we want to talk about the problem generally instead of talking about a specific solution. And I, I don't know if we have any writers here, but actually we've all had to write essays for our classes, right? And something you've probably heard is that after you write something, you should set it aside for a day or two and then revisit it later on to more comprehensively catch any errors that you may have. And, it, and that's just because it helps to look at things with a fresh pair of eyes, right? It's sort of similar when it comes to designing a website. If you were to design your own website, you probably would be very familiar with it. You'd be too familiar with it and too close to your design to understand exactly what someone else needs or how someone else will see and interact with that website, right? And so you can also talk to people to help you analyze and test when you're building the website, how they use it. And so these are just some example questions you can ask about design. You can have someone use your website and literally observe them do this big important task that your website is meant to do. You can ask people to walk you through filter emails if your website is meant to help people filter emails. You can talk, you can tell people to walk you through a single gameplay round, for example. And then have them, have them explain how this compares to other games that they've seen. Tell me about the strengths and weaknesses of our game compared to other games that you've played. And think about whether someone's comments are valid. If they are, is there something you can change? And again, that's the action item that can write right at the end of your interview. 
It might also give someone specific tasks, tasks to do in the form of like a written list. So then like, you know, change your username to something else. View the global leaderboard that we have. And when they're doing that, you can record the time that it takes to, for them to do these tasks. If it takes them too long, something might be wrong with your design and you might wanna go in and change things and make it easier for people. You can also tell people to talk aloud as they're going through any tasks and record what they're saying. If they express frustration at a certain point, maybe that's something that can change. Interviews are iterative, so you might not always be asking people the same question. In fact, maybe you should not always ask people the same question. And that's a good thing, right? And I would also, I would also suggest that instead of talking to like three people twice, like once to understand what needs or wants they have, and then once when you have your minimum viable prototype to fix your website, I would recommend talking to like six different people so that you don't pre-bias anyone with any ideas or anything like that. You can have one person on your team who's sort of dedicated to interviewing people and compiling their feedback and implementing their feedback. But I think that, I hope that this is something that all members of your team would be trying out just a little bit at least. I guess just um, a short O about design, I'll go through these quickly. So this is, I don't know, okay. Okay, so I guess like, I was gonna ask people what they think is different about this, but I guess I'll just skip that. But I guess like in terms of the UI, especially consider if your controls are hidden or not. Is it possible that you can press a certain button or maybe you can highlight something and right click to get a certain feature, but that's not intuitive for people. So try to make things more obvious to people. You don't wanna overload people with information. Maybe your controls are too cluttered. You don't wanna do that. So for example, in this example, maybe you can think about combining these two boxes into a single larger box. You think about combining the information, the, the date and the ranking of a player into a single box. Maybe this whole thing can be a single box. You basically wanna avoid overloading people. Think about the brightness, size, color, contrast of your buttons. Are the colors in here bold enough? Do they stand out enough? Do they give people the feel that you want people to have? Also think about whether your design is consistent with the people's expectations, right? So in that news example, people might be expecting a social media share feature. So are these lines consistent or are they drastically different from similar websites? I also want to give people clear and immediate feedback after any input and William talked about this too. So if you have a lot of processing time, you probably want a loading screen. You can also use like a CSS on hover effect for buttons. So if you hover, if you hover over a particular, I don't know, button in your header, maybe make that button change, maybe make the text change a color so people know that they can click on it. Little things like that. And then you should also think about which setting should be modifiable, which should be automatic. So let's say that you're making a game and your game tracks the win rate of players, right? Do you want there to be a setting for people to reset their win rates in order to, I don't know, perfect the game or something like that? Or do you not want that? Is that a little bit too much for the user? Other considerations, you should have simple, understandable instructions. Oh, you, you, you want to gate fewer features. So if you're making something and Linking your account with Spotify lets you unlock extra features. You still want to try to give people as many features as they can feasibly access without Spotify before prompting them to link with Spotify, for example, and unlock any extra features. You should have clear prompts, menus for important steps. If you have a bunch of different prompts and menus that you're giving people, they might just be rapidly clicking through them and not actually reading everything. And that could be a problem because someone might accidentally click through a screen that they wanted to read. They click through it. Now they can't read it anymore. So whenever you give people menus with dialogue, I feel like that you should give away for people to easily go back and retrieve that information again. You should also format information consistently. So if you look at this example here, you have some dates that are written with just numerals. You also have a more expanded version of a date where you also write the day of the week. You should probably try to keep these consistent. So either using one or the other format. And also when you're thinking about what settings you want your user to have access to, maybe you can make it so that your user can choose how they want their dates to be displayed. And then finally, Prioritize the key important features. And that is written on the WebLab website under the milestones. So yeah, that's it for this lecture. So let's get out of this classroom. Let's get started. I really do want to encourage you to, oh yeah. I, so yeah, I, I wasn't lying when I said there were three goals of this lecture. So one, I really wanna encourage you to always think deeper about an underlying feature, let's say. What is it about this feature that makes me say that it's really cool? What do I see that makes me say that? I want you to think about, customer wants and needs, and not just think about things in terms of features. I feel like that's a problem that I, I personally encounter a lot. And finally, I want you to talk to some real people. They could be, I don't know, 
people who live in your dorm. They could be older people if you're designing a website for older people. But basically, talk to people and get what they feel their problems are and see if you can try to address them. And yeah, that's it. Thanks, everyone.